it's really pleasing that I can't see you because uh, despite having worked a lot with really naughty boys you're actually more frightening um, I've got my own timer because it's uh, 30 minutes so sorry about that um, and I don't want somebody else to tell me because uh, then they know that I'm running over time um, so uh, my name is Lindsay Skinner. I actually have just started um, this year at Bridgewater College Academy, just up the road. Um, I'm actually an English teacher, but when I did Mr. Drew School for Boys, I was a maths teacher. And that was largely uh, me being a bit naive and getting screwed over by them. Um, they uh, contacted my school. I worked in two schools in Bournemouth that were um, in special measures. And we took them out of special measures, and so the TV show contacted us and said, have you got any teachers that might want to be really sad and give up their whole summer to teach? And I was one of those people. And, um, and they led me to believe I'd be the English teacher, and then they found a famous rap battler who used to be an English teacher. And, of course, Mark Grist um, was way more popular than I was, and so he was the English teacher, and I ended up teaching maths. So... Um, so Bob um, asked me to come and talk a little bit and normally I do talk quite a lot actually, um, not just in life but uh, in front of people because I work for Pixel as well as, um, as, well as teaching and, um, and so I'm quite used to speaking but normally I speak about things like grammar and English and um, talking about behaviour is a little bit more difficult I think because, um, because I think so much of it is, is common sense and so much of it is just about your ability to build relationships um, but nevertheless I'm going to... Um, talk to you about 38 things that I learned from the 11 naughty boys that I worked with. Um, 38 things for no reason other than that um, when I sat down to think about it, there were 38 things that came to mind. So um, I'm going to talk to you about those and even if you just take away a couple of those things that you don't necessarily consider every day, hopefully that will be of use to you. Um, so the first thing, uh, the reason that this naughty is an in inverted commas is because um, I don't believe that any child is actually naughty and I think that the label of that is actually really unhelpful. Um, I'm a real believer that if a kid can behave in some context, in some classroom, anywhere, then they are not naughty because naughty uh, implies continuous and that they are always naughty. And I think it's our job as professionals to find where they're not naughty and the reasons for that and figure out how we can make them not naughty or not behave naughtily in our own classrooms. And um, I had an interesting interaction um, with a guy called Jeff Dawkins not very long ago and, um, and he talked about meeting a woman who said, but you don't know what our kids are like because you don't work in a school like ours and you know you can take a horse to water but you can't make them drink. And, um, and he just said, but it's your job to make them thirsty. That's your job. And I, and I can't, can't think of a, a better analogy myself, so I will just steal his. Um, it's our job to inspire children to not want to be naughty and to figure out why they're naughty so that we can make them not behave in that manner. Um, so then uh, you can probably see who already is my favourite because there's quite a lot, a lot of pictures of Clark. Um, one thing that came out of... Um, out of this, this session was lovely. I spent four weeks with these kids, and I don't know, it, some of you won't have watched the show. Um, we went and we lived in Essex um, in like a university site, and we lived on site with the children and with their parents. And actually, in many respects, the parents were more challenging than the children um, because they're big, if nothing else. Um, uh, and one thing that came about is I quite often end up getting the name Skin Dog. I don't know why, um, kids often end up calling me that. Um, and they started calling Miss Skinny, which is simply the best nickname I've ever had. I was like, my self-esteem was through the roof. Um, but actually me giving the kids nicknames um, personalised my relationship with them. It made it special in, in comparison to every relationship they had with everybody else. And they knew that I liked them because otherwise I wouldn't have made up a nickname. And um, so this is Clark, and um, I used to call him Clark Kent, which actually was lost on him at first, um, which made me feel a bit old. But um, then, then he became Superman, and um, I'd, I'd made this Kevin uh, character on the, uh, on the, as part of our display. And he then, uh, as you can see in the picture, drew me a picture to show that he was like Kevin, he was a superhero, he was Clark Kent. And that special relationship that was created just through a nickname um, was instant. And, uh, and I would recommend that you, you try and do that kind of banter thing with your, with your most difficult children. Um, this is lovely. That we had a thing. Um, every single, every single um, day, children would get an award. So they would get, I would give a maths award every single day. And there were 11 of them, so then a 1 in 11 chance. And if they tried really hard or done really well, they'd get a maths award. Um, 
And, and I decided to play Hangman um, with Tom at break time because at break time that was when Tom got in a lot of trouble. Um, and so this is what he put on his mini whiteboard for us to play Hangman. Uh, out of all the things in the world he could have written about. And it made me realise how much the award mattered to him. And, um, and what's interesting about that is that there was no prize, there was no money. Uh, it was simply a piece of cardboard. Um, but it was the recognition that he'd done well. And that's really, really important. And for him, the idea that he would be publicly recognised, and not just privately, but publicly recognised for doing something well, meant enough that on a Friday, he was telling me that he was going to get the Mass Award on the Monday. And um, I think public recognition of achievement at any level, not just attainment, but achievement in anything, out of school and in school, is really, really important. Um, this was uh, a really lovely day. Clark. Um, was really difficult actually and, and annoyed an awful lot of people and Sarah um, was one of the parents, she was Spencer's mum and um, she said to me I don't know how you deal with him, I really I really dislike him and I, and I hate myself for disliking him but I do and um, so I asked Clark um, because I knew he was really fascinated by nature to take myself and Sarah on a nature trail and um, on our bikes off we went and uh, we got to this field and um, and he just said, you need to put your bike down and creep up to the field and be really careful because there are going to be rabbits in this field. And then um, we, we crept up and she saw a completely different side of him. And she realised actually he's just a kid and he's a kid who's fascinated by animals or, or whatever. And it was about finding that connection. And after that, she felt very differently and about Clark and therefore she treated him differently. And um, I think that extracurricular activities um, allow that. Um, so I would recommend to you, if you've got any kids who are, who are challenging, that you absolutely go and watch their football matches, that if they're in the show, you go and see it. That you find out if they've got a boxing match and you go and see it, even if it's out of school. Because lots of these children don't have people who care enough to actually go. And if you show them that you care enough to go, they can't help but care back. Um, I think with bad behaviour, and uh, particularly if you're an NQT or a PGC student, you need a bit of perspective. Um, there's a lovely model, um, I'm a little bit of a, a geek and I quite like reading educational research, and there's a lovely model that's, um, if you imagine a white piece of paper, and draw a great big box just with a black liner all, all the way around that bit of paper, and then inside you draw a circle, a little spot, a little black spot. If you ask people what's in, in the box, they'll say a black spot, um, and they'll ignore the masses of white that are, are in the box. And I think we do that a little bit with behaviour. So um, we have this idea that, oh God, uh, Ofsted are in, or my head of department's there, or um, I need to get them prepared for this exam, this, this immense pressure. And because Jake is being a pain in the arse in the corner, that's all we see. And we forget, actually, that there are 30 children who are sat down, and there are 30 children who aren't talking over you, and there are 30 children who've got their pens out, and there are 30 children who want to learn. And you feel like you're failing because one kid's kicking off or off task or whatever it is that they're doing. And even if it's two or three kids. Now, I'm not saying that we should ignore that. And I'm not saying that we should think, oh, well, um, it, it doesn't matter because everybody else is doing all right. But what I am saying is you need to keep it in perspective. Because if you can keep it in perspective, you don't get het up about it. And you can respond to it in a, in a calm way and actually in a logical way. And you need to not get clouded by the idea that you failed or that it's all going wrong because one or two children are off task. Um, another picture of Clark. Um, this is lovely. This, he, he was uh, the best um, insect catcher I've ever, ever met. And, um, and I said to him, um, I can't even remember what had gone wrong, but I think I was wearing a PE kit was probably the issue, um, which we had to do. Uh, we had to partake in the PE lessons. And for anyone that knows anything about me, just look at me. I'm not really a PE girl. Um, and he said, Miss, you look sad. And I said, you need to go away and find something for me that will make me happy. And he came back with this, um, apparently it's not what I think it is. It's a damselfly uh, because it's only got one set of wings. Um, and he came back and he caught it and, and then he gave it to me and that's, I'm holding it in that picture about perspective. Um, he loved the idea that he had a little job and we gave kids loads of little jobs of like giving out water. Um, it's really used in primary school and I think we forget about it a little bit in secondary school because it feels patronising but actually uh, they love it and I think maybe even big kids quite like the responsibility of, um, of being given a job. This is Tom. <laughs> uh, it's funny, when I talk about the show with people who have watched it, they always say, like, oh, my God, they were horrible, uh, or, oh, they weren't all likeable, or, or whatever, and actually, um, I completely disagree. I, I'm not convinced there are any people, but uh, definitely there aren't any children that you can't find something to love about. 
and I think they can feel it if you do love something about them. And that doesn't mean that um, that you respect or like everything about them. Like this kid who looks so cute in that picture and who you can't help but like from that picture is the same kid who stamped on people and who I'm um, not going to swear because it's being filmed. And you think I'd be used to that, but apparently not so much. Um, who, who swore at people, who bit, who punched people. It's the same kid. But there's something lovable, lovable about him. And it's really, really important to harness that because otherwise, what... What are you fighting for? What, why are you going to try and make them behave? Because you will just write them off if you can't find something to like about them. So if you've got that really naughty child, go away and find them in a scenario where they're doing something likeable and then try to recreate that in your class, the climate where they can show you that person. Um, this is Zane's family. Um, they, th uh, unfortunately for me, I ended up mentoring Zane. And Zane was quite a shouter, and, um, and so were his whole family. They, just shouted at each other all of the time and um and tracy the behavior expert on this said something that was i thought was really um kind of obvious but actually quite profound if you're shouting all of the time you might as well be whispering because they're used to it uh and i think that we forget that sometimes a little bit i'm not a shouter in school not really a pedagogical choice but actually just i'd be the one that would go all high-pitched and sound stupid so i so i don't and i'm better at humor than i am at shouting but i do think that if you've got a kid who's being shouted at repeatedly at home or repeatedly across the school, it doesn't mean anything to them. When you shout, it should make people stand to attention. It should make people go, oh my God. And if you're shouting a lot in the classroom or in the corridor, they won't do that because they'll be used to that and you might as well be whispering. So you need to try and find another way rather than just immediately go into raising your voice. Um, brilliantly in my lesson, um, Tom drew a cock on the board. Um, and, and it was actually a bit difficult because I teach secondary school children and so we had um, age 8 to 12. So not only did, did we take 11 naughty boys who were either permanently excluded or nearly there, that were really naughty, put them all in one classroom, they're all different abilities and they're aged 8 to 12. Teach them maths, oh, which you don't teach, brilliant. So you can imagine quite a stressful situation and it's quite easy in, in that kind of a context to fight fire with fire. So a kid shouts and you shout back. Um, and that just goes against all logic, really, doesn't it? Because actually, fight fire with water. And Rob Long taught me that on an NQT conference um, that I went on nine years ago. And, um, and it's really, really stuck with me. Always, always be the water to the fire. Um, and, and it's difficult, because these kids are middle school kids or um, around that age group. Normally, I, I probably would have responded to that if that was a secondary school kid by, like, that's small, uh, or, or whatever. Um, it's a little bit harder, isn't it, when you're, when you're with uh, primary school children. I, I think I probably did say something equally as rude to Tom. Um, but what I love is just how inaccurate the drawing is. Um, I mean, I'm not a massive expert, but, like... Um, it's not a wonder they're lesbians, is it, if they look like that? Um, this is um, the one and the only Mr Drew. Um, it, it, a bizarre character. Um, and kind of brilliant. People talk a lot about his patience. I think that patience isn't a skill, uh, particularly. I think that, or uh, well, maybe it is a skill, but I don't think it's a hard to learn skill. Um, but uh, one thing that he taught me that I think is really important is that standards will sit just wherever you put them, just below that. So um, a good measure of that, I think, as a teacher is, if a member of SLT walks into your classroom and kids start adjusting their ties or kids take off their scarves, um, your standards aren't high enough. Because if the SLT member of staff makes them think, oh God, I haven't done this or I haven't done that, um, then why don't they think that in your classroom? And, um, and what I think is really brilliant is that um, kids will rebel, which is why it will always hover just below where your standards are. But um, when I went to Winton and Glenmore for, God, just over four years ago now, um, my first week there, a kid held a boy down in a fight, sprayed deodorant on him and caught him on fire. Uh, week one, all good. Um, and, you know, there were stabbings and, like, some of our kids stamped a homeless man to death. Like, it was a, it was a rough school, really rough. And um, the head came in and he changed where the expectations for behaviour were. And, um, and as a result, instead of rebelling by having a fight or rebelling by catching a coat on fire, they were rebelling by not wearing their tie or not tucking their shirt in. And that's brilliant. If that's their rebellion, then, uh, then I think that's a really good place for us to be as, in school. Um, this one's an interesting one. Um, just, it's really easy 
to be like, you're going to be in detention for the rest of the year, which you're not. And they know that's not true. And you know it's not true. But you just go to the biggest sanction because you're trying to fight them away from bad behavior. Um, and a really nice example of that in the show was um, they went, we went on a camping trip, which I actually didn't go on because I was concussed. And that's another story. Um, the dangers of a job, I guess. Um, and... Um, and Helen, the mum of Clark, said, if you don't do this particular thing, you all day, you're going to be um, not partaking any of the activities. And that really left her nowhere to go, because if he then didn't do it, which he didn't, it meant the whole day was ruined. And so it's just about, just before you think of a sanction for, with a kid, just uh, taking a step back and thinking, is it a balanced response? Um, and is it something that I can actually deliver that's not going to then just ruin everything? Um, I think that's just always worth bearing in mind. Um, everybody loves a clown and uh, apparently a pirate. Um, this is Mark Grist, the English teacher, and um, he was more creative at teaching it than I would be because I'm like very much focused on grammar. Um, but I think what's important is that um, sometimes kids are funny. Uh, Tom drawing a, a knob on the board is actually funny, particularly because it was so rubbish. And, uh, and I think that um, it's important that they see that you have that humanity. So I've got a kid called George, and the people who, I won't say his surname, but the people who are in the room who work at my school will know who he is. Um, and quite often he will do something just completely ridiculous in my lesson. And I'll laugh and be like, you're very funny, but you're on the doom board. And so the kids think I'm a human being. Um, and I think that's really important that they need to see you as that. So recognize that what kids are doing are funny is funny but it's not appropriate in this context um, rather than just going in with a telling off because otherwise they don't see you as human beings um, this is this is an interesting one Tom was um, a really lively character um, who went from really funny happy you saw that picture earlier through to being extraordinarily violent through to crying and on the very first day um, I was working as a TA in the classroom for um, one of Mr Drew's lessons Tom walked out uh, kick somebody uh, on the way out and then just wanted to go and find his mum so I took him across the site and went and showed his, uh, him to his mum and we talked about what had happened and he just said I want to kill myself I want to die, I hate myself and, um, and I was like oh don't cry on National Delhi um, but nevertheless felt like my only response to that was that I, I wanted to sob and, um, and what I realised is that, that self esteem was just so important to him and I think we often think of poor self esteem causing bad behavior but we don't always realize necessarily that poor behavior causes low self-esteem and and that we should just bear that in mind and that that's why praise is so important that's why catching somebody good being good is so important um and putting things into perspective with kids yeah you made the wrong choice there but you don't have to make the wrong choice tomorrow um and giving them an opportunity to build up that self-esteem um i think that's really important um the next thing is just it's not personal. Um, much as uh, I teach in a very personal way and I'm really open with the kids about um, my personality and the fact that I support Manchester United, etc., etc. Um, when a kid tells someone to F off or whatever it is, um, it is not personal because you are such a tiny, tiny part of that kid's life and there's a million other things going on. Either that's their response they've been taught or they're annoyed from earlier or whatever. And so even if it feels personal, even if they're calling you fat or ugly or whatever it is, um, usually you are not the only cause of that behavior and um and to think of it as not personal i think helps you in dealing with it because if you can depersonalize it you can rationalize it and then you can move on um doing what you said you'd, you would uh, a classic it's just so easy to not do that um because uh, like i'm really disorganized um how on earth i sustain um an assistant head role i do not know because like i forget my car key and just leave it on the side and then can't go home and stuff like that so so doing what i said i would in terms of detentions and stuff is actually sometimes a little bit of a challenge for me but if you don't do exactly what you said you were going to do um and say for example you say i'm going to give you one more warning and then this is going to happen and then you ignore it and you tactically ignore it it's a bad idea so you need to be really clear i'm going to give you one more warning and then this is going to happen. And so you give the one more warning, and then you don't ignore it, and they have that sanction, and you make sure you actually follow it through. Because otherwise your sanctions and your warnings mean nothing. And so of course they push it. Um, and I think if, if you're an NQT or PGC student, you need, to, you need to be careful about making sure that you always follow through. But one bit of advice I would give is make praise personal. So um, 
if a kid does something that's good, always make it personal and make it about them and how wonderful they are and, and how great they are. And, it, and as soon as it's not praise and it's about a sanction, um, make it professional. So it's not that you're a bad human being, um, but you did this and as a result, this is gonna happen. Um, doesn't mean I, I don't like you, I'm not cross, but that's the sanction. Uh, and I think that that depersonalizing it is a really useful way of delivering sanctions without causing damage to relationships. Um, I hate this picture of me, but I only put it on because Spencer's crying. Um, so you've got like a really naughty boy who's nearly been permanently excluded, not allowed to play for his football team at school because he's so violent, um, working with teachers over the summer holidays for four weeks, and when he has to leave, he cries. Um, and I think that partly that was because he felt like um, he knew us, and he felt like we'd become part of his like everyday life. And, um, and there was an interesting um, scenario that happened. Um, if you haven't guessed from my outfit, I'm gay. And um, I, um, I had this scenario with Tom, um, who came up to me at the end of an assembly and said, um, you're a liar. And there were three video cameras on me, and I'm thinking, oh, don't, don't recall lying. And he said, you're a lesbian, and you didn't tell me. <laughs> and suddenly I'm thinking, oh no, I'm gonna have to be out to everybody forever. Um, and there's TV camera crew, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, oh, I haven't lied. I've just, um, cause of course, kids like that end up saying, oh, have you got a boyfriend? Have you got this, that? And I'd always just been really um, evasive. So I've got a partner and using the word they instead of he or she. And, um, and what I realized is that he genuinely felt a bit betrayed cause he felt like I'd shared myself with him. And then he found out that I'd lied in his eyes. And, um, and actually, then I came up very quickly and there was only one issue and that was where um, um, one of the twins punched Dominic in the face because Dominic laughed about the fact that I was a lesbian so he punched him in the face. But other than that, there were no issues about my sexuality. Um, and and uh, I've always taken the approach um, that I'm really open with kids, not necessarily about my sexuality because that is quite personal uh, and potentially leaves you vulnerable, but about the fact that um, I've got little sisters who are six and 11, I talk about them. I talk about um, my love of football, I talk about theater or, or whatever, because if they see you as a human being, it makes it a little bit more difficult for them to want to destroy you. Um, having been the kind of kid whose mum had to come in every Friday to monitor my progress because I was so naughty, I recognize that this is probably true that um, a lot of the time I was bored. And I think, um, it's not necessarily that smart kids are better at being naughty, um, but just that they're better at not getting caught. And, um, and actually, in many respects, this is a problem because you've got your smart kids and they come in and they've got to make progress, but they're too busy being naughty to, to make the progress. And there's a lot of pressure there. And, um, and I think that um, you need to really focus on harnessing uh, a kid's intellect if they're naughty in your lesson. So um, make them a mentor for someone who's less able or, and this is what my maths teacher did when I was a kid, um, I, I was quite good at maths and, um, and easily probably the best in my class. And then a Korean girl joined the class and he made her sit next to me. And I didn't want to sit next to her uh, because I wanted to sit next to my best friend. And every single lesson I said, Look, Mr. Baldwin, can I move? Mr. Baldwin, can I move? And every lesson he said no. And she was um, really academically able and better than me. And as it turns out, I don't like that very much. So. Um, <laughs> So I just started to work harder and harder, and then suddenly it clicked, and I was like, oh my god. And I just went out to Miss Bob, and I said, I know why you've sat, I can't remember her name, I know why you've sat, sat me next to blah, blah, blah. Um, it's because she's better than me at it. And he said, I knew you'd find out eventually. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think if you've got a really smart kid, they will want to be good at it, and putting them against somebody else who's clever will bring out the competition. Um, it's really easy to use SLT as an enemy, like, you know, I don't care if you take off your coat, but it's the school rules, that kind of thing. Um, and I think that kind of helps you avoid conflict sometimes, but I actually don't think it's very useful. Um, and I think you absolutely need a united front. Even if you disagree with the policy, you have to pretend that you do agree. Um, and then deal with that issue somewhere else um, by going and challenging the policy. Um, I do think a common enemy works, though. Um, up until um, not very long ago, my common enemy that I used with the kids was Michael Gove. So... Um, uh, and I don't know anyone who doesn't hate him, so that was easy. And, um, and every time my kids, I, I pretty much always teach CD board line kids. Every time they were off task, I projected a picture of Gove and underneath it said, I want a generation of young people who understand how it feels to fail. That's a quote, good. Um, and they hated him. Um, and I just said, you know, knock yourself out. If you want to be the failure, you knock yourself out. And immediately they're on task again. So uh, an outside common enemy is quite easy. And I think that Nick, Nicky Murphy's not that difficult to dislike either. Um, 
And so that, that's quite a nice way to do it. And, and this is so extreme that um, I had a kid called Mikey who went on a, an audition in London and genuinely, they walked past the Ministry for Education and genuinely said to the music teacher, um, is this where that effing wanker lives? <laughs> and he said, what? And he went, that effing wanker with the glasses. He said, you mean Michael Gove? And he went, I hate him. I hate him. He's a total idiot. He was like, what are you talking about? He was like, Miss Skinner talks about every lesson. So then I get this email saying, you've brainwashed the kids. So if, to be honest, if my kids don't leave with GCSE, they, they do leave with like um, left-wing values. Um, um, competition and teamwork's brilliant, and they absolutely love it. If you put them in little groups of four, sometimes in K constructors, if you think that would be useful in your subject, um, and you award points for um, them c coming to attention when you ask them to, uh, good behaviour, um, making you laugh, um, the, a good answer, etc., etc. What that means is you've got a kid who's not very academically able, but, but they can fold their arms and listen to you quickly, and they get a point for their table. That makes them feel validated in the lesson. But it also means that they self-police. So some of my naughtiest boys are my most competitive, and they're the ones going, shut up, because they know that they're going to lose points if they, uh, someone's talking over. Um, it's a really lovely way uh, to run your classroom, I think, so that everything is a game. I've just got a weekly uh, chart, so they've got tables one to five, and uh, every lesson they collect up, and then the team at the end with the points um, wins whatever, whatever it is that's in my school that's the reward policy. Um, it's really lovely, and it means I spend almost no time telling people off because they're too busy telling each other off. Um, just imagine that picture you've got there with, um, with the, I can't remember what they're called, javelins, um, in an unstructured time. <laughs> like, they'd be dead children, wouldn't they? Um, and I think it's just worth bearing in mind, particularly at a senior leadership, middle leadership um, level, that um, particularly children with special educational needs or social needs um, get, in, get in the most trouble at that time or feel the most vulnerable at that time and arranging some kind of activities or um, a safe place is a really good idea and that teachers can offer that at each level but that also strategically it would be good to have that offered. Um, differentiation was massive like it, <laughs> it was a bit overwhelming because I'm so used to teaching this kind of CD borderline they're all sort of at a particular level and then going and teaching kids from age um, 8 through to 12 and, and some of the 12 year olds being really quite bright in mass, so I was working from like a, a 2A, like top 2A, so not that levels exist anymore, but you know what I mean, um, through to a top six in the lesson. Um, and that was really a potential problem because it meant that kids were struggling with their self-esteem. So, so one thing that worked really well is just to um, use a skills tracker. Um, people who've worked with Pixel will be familiar with their PLCs or Covey charts anyway. But um, literally we had different skills and then different children were working on different things at the same time. And I didn't necessarily even need to plan that. Um, and they just were red, amber, green. So if they were red, they knew they needed to work on that skill and they would um, come to me and I would give them an activity based on that skill. So kids all over the classroom doing different things that were right for their own challenge. And like in English, that's really, really easy because you say, well, we're doing a writing task. You guys are just writing simple sentences. You guys are writing simple and compound. You're writing complex and you're doing multiple phrases and clauses. Try and pop in a semicolon. You haven't done any differentiation in terms of time in terms of outcome you have. Um, and that means that they stay engaged. Um, this was when I, I was a, a learning support assistant or LA, um, LSA, whatever, um, before I was a teacher for a year. And the best advice anyone ever gave me was a woman called Pauline, uh, who's a geography teacher, and she was brilliant. And um, she just said, even if you don't believe it, you have to make everybody else believe it. Uh, that in those four walls, everything happens because you want it to. And your body language has to show that. Um, and I was talking to my partner about this um, a couple of days ago and I was writing this presentation and she said that she'd had really similar feedback from um, her PGC mentor but um, that they, she was told that what happens in your, uh, what happens in your classroom happens because you allow it to and that if a kid doesn't make progress it's because you've allowed them not to and if a kid is poorly behaved it's because you've allowed that to happen. And, and I think that can be quite a horrible message in a way but I do think it's something that we should consider and if even if you don't believe it, you do need to make everybody else believe that you're in control because then they're much less likely to challenge you. Um, I don't know when this photograph was taken, but I do. Um, I, I think it's important that I'm probably the most powerful person in the photo, and yet I'm of the lowest status physically. And Deborah Myhill, when she trained me, told me that exact thing, that you should be able to walk into a classroom and that the person who's physically of the lowest status is still the most powerful. Um, utterly, I was in control of that situation. Everyone was trying to um, 
do their maths in order to open a, a box. So I did like a treasure, a treasure thing and they got to a box with a code. And when each person worked out their own personalized worksheet, which actually was a differentiation that took a long time, but um, it got to a number and that was a number in the, uh, the lock and then they could open it and get the prize. Um, but the body language is really important because teachers who um, get up in somebody's face, um, it, it just makes it worse. Um, even if you have to pretend on a kind of February morning um, when it's really snowy and wet and everyone comes in and they're being more on, um, even if you have to pretend. Um, because if somebody's really enthusiastic and really bubbly about something, it's really hard for that not to be catching. And um, try and create lessons that are genuinely enjoyable. This actually, oddly enough, um, was my first lesson with them, not the lesson they showed on my TV show. That's another thing I learned that they can edit really, really well. Um, they were way naughtier than, than what it seemed, like way naughtier. Um, and, and look at the joy on their faces. Like, I love that picture. And, and why? Because I'm smiling and I'm laughing. I look at my body language again, really open. And, and as a result, they, they felt positive about the lesson. Um, shock horror. Um, um, I don't know what else to say about that other than that um, Tom was the best case of ADHD I've ever seen, which was um, he would be like, having a normal conversation with you, um, could do something completely irrational and not really think it through, like smack someone in the head and then be really sad about it a few days later. Now, it doesn't mean I'm an advocate for medication. It doesn't mean I'm an advocate for um, any particular route with ADHD, kids who've got ADHD, but I do think that it, that it is really real and that um, people who say that it's not are uh, um, ill-informed. Um, this one, children see, children do. Um, you know, you've got a 12-year-old child there playing Call of Duty. Um, and, and that's fine, but I just think that what's important for um, us as professionals is that we're always a role model. Always, always, you have to be an immaculate role model. So um, if you are shouting, they will think it's all right to shout. And if you are deriding about someone, they'll think that's all right. Um, and so you just, in everything you do, you just need to try and be the best role model because quite a lot of the kids who are naughty don't have those, which is why they're naughty in the first place. Um, and that, that kind of links to that every behaviour has a cause. This was also actually something that Rob Long talked about. Um, the fact that it was so long ago, and I remember it, I think probably talks about how important a message it is, but that it's a really good idea to just try and figure out what the motivation is behind a behaviour. So if you've got a kid who's always naughty in your lesson and you've tried everything, go, go away and try and figure out why would they behave like that? Is it because they can't access it? Is it because it's boring? Is it because um, actually they don't like where they're sat? Or whatever it might be. And then try and preempt that poor behaviour by, by solving that issue. And sometimes there are multiple causes, uh, but sometimes it's really quite straightforward. Um, that's it for that one, really. Um, it just really is really scary to do with really loads of naughty boys and like flames and stuff. Um, uh, sorry about the formatting of that. Um, adults choose the climate. Um, that's really important. The more you can smile, the better. There was this lovely um, study that was done uh, quite, quite some time ago, actually, where um, every member of staff was allocated a child who uh, expressed behavioural difficulties, and, um, and they were just told to smile at that kid and use their name um, and say something positive every time they saw them, and their exclusions fell through the uh, floor. Now, is that causal? I don't know. Uh, but I do, I do feel that um, when people grin at you or make a joke or, or say something positive, um, that that makes a difference and uh, and it's worth having a go because it costs you nothing to do. Another study that's quite interesting is um, a study on choices. Um, people, when given uh, two or three choices, are most likely, statistically, to choose the final choice. And how many times have you said, do your work or get out of my classroom? All right, bye, see ya. Um, Actually, just it's worth it's worthwhile if you've got two or three choices for a child, putting the one you want them to choose last and trying to make it sound the most appealing. Um, and it's so you know you're going to have to get out of my classroom. You're going to be an ATE or whatever you've got. It's your system for that. Um, or you can do work and um, and I'll help you, or Bob will help you, or whatever. Um, it's it's just a tiny little um, nuance, and I don't know why that's the case, but statistically it is the case. Um, this is really important. Um, find something to like about a kid and just make them think you think they're wonderful because so many kids who have repeated behaviour problems, uh, nobody likes them, nobody wants to teach them. Every time they come in the room, it's like, oh, no. Um, and they know that. And so if they've got this one teacher in school who thinks they're marvellous, they don't want to ruin that relationship because they haven't got it with anybody else. 
And so just pretend. I told Zane, who's the one that had that horrible ponytail thing growing out the back of his head, that I loved his ponytail. How long did it take to grow? It's so lovely. It's just a lie. It's horrible. But he felt like I thought he was cool. So even if there's nothing positive you can say about a kid, say something nice about their hair or whatever, just make them feel that you like them. And again, that links back to the extracurricular stuff. If you can do that, it's really difficult. There's a woman at work, um, not this work actually, fortunately, my other work, who um, I just find really irritating. I don't know what it is about her, but I don't really naturally like her. But she's so bloody nice to me. That I can't help but just, I can't help but give her the time of day because she's so nice. And it's ideal if you can make a kid feel that. Again, back to the editing. Um, the first assembly, it took 40 minutes to get them to sit down. 40 minutes, uh, which they don't show. Um, and the, yeah, obviously. And then after a certain routine kicked in, they started to, to get into that routine. Um, it's just really worthwhile um, you having a routine for your classroom that every single day they come in and there's already a starter on the board and you're greeting them at the door and that a particular kid does the books or whatever. If you've got that routine, you don't need to keep saying it. And um, one thing that um, is quite nice and that I've done and the kids hate is I've made a video of myself at the end of a lesson saying, make sure your homework's in your planner, uh, make sure that the pens are blah, 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 all the kind of things I want for the end of a lesson. And I just, on my smart board, just play it on repeat, which means I can go and do other stuff. Um, and they just want it to turn off, so they just do it quickly. And that's a really nice, it takes you five minutes to, to make and, and works a treat. Um, I'm gonna rush through these last ones because I'm, I'm a bit aware of time. Um, always just be aware of that. They're just a kid. They're a child and you make stupid mistakes. I wore like leopard skin flares when I was a child because I thought they were cool. Um, I wore a shell suit. Um, uh, you make stupid decisions and I think probably adults do too, but just always bear in mind that you're the adult and you're the one that has that logical reasoning that they don't necessarily have. Um, conflict. You can't always avoid conflict because sometimes people are doing things and they need to be challenged. And what I would do is um, take away the audience because it's really hard when you're a teenage boy or girl to lose face in front of your peers. So at one point I was giving out awards and Max uh, was a kid who had really low self-esteem and I gave him an award for something really small. And Jake was annoyed he hadn't got the award and he was like, oh, well, that's stupid because that was really easy and I could have answered that question. Um, it ended up in a bit of a conflict and I said, Jake, I'm going to switch you in a minute. I want you to wait outside. He was like, no. I'm not going to leave your classroom, make me. And I'm like, oh no, there's all these cameras, what am I going to do? And I said, okay, that's fine, stay where you are. Everybody else will finish this in the corridor. And I took, I mean, it's easier when there's only 11 of them. I took all 10 of them out. We finished it in the corridor and Jake had no audience. And then they all went and then he spoke to me, it was totally normal. Um, and it was like, mm, one nil to Skinner. <laughs> um, I think it's really important. It's really hard uh, for kids to have a positive attitude about school if their parents don't. Um, and I think it's really common, if you reflect on your own practice, um, how many times, my best friend's ringing me, my time has disappeared and my best friend's ringing instead. Um, good. How many times is the first phone call home you've made to a parent been because it's bad? Uh, I'm certainly guilty of that. Um, kids across the board, if you can just make time to make a positive phone call really early on, when you ring for something bad, they'll be on your side. Uh, particularly if you've told them that you like their kid. Um, because they're not necessarily used to hearing that. I've had a, a parent, so he'd be like, no, 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 I've got a girl, I'm driving, I've got a girl. And I was like, oh, I just want to say he's wonderful. She was like, I'll pull over. Um, just so used to hearing bad things. And actually, then, when there was a problem, she was totally on my side, to the point where I've been round to a kid's house and taken his PlayStation controllers from his bedroom, and she let me in because she trusts that I know what I'm doing. And then he came in and was like, I hate you, who even are you? And I was like, well, behave, and then we're not going to have a problem, are we? And then he behaved, and he got his controllers back. Um, I think this one's really important. It's so easy when a kid's really het up to go in and be like, calm down. You know what? When I'm annoyed and I'm cross or whatever, or I've got PMT, and my partner tells me to calm down, I want to scream and just, ah, that's the worst thing you can say. It's like a red rag to a ball. So actually, just listen. If a kid's got an issue, it doesn't mean you're validating them, but it does mean it, it absolutely makes them feel that you've listened, and then you can start dealing with the problem. I th because we want to solve it and you want to solve it quickly and because you've got to be on duty and all those things, sometimes you just go in with, oh, this is the solution, do this, this and this. But it's really important to give kids that, that listening time, I think. And then finally, I just want you to imagine the teacher who made the most difference in your life. And if you haven't got one, I'll be really surprised. It, I listen to Radio 4 a lot because I have no life and I'm really sad. And, um, and uh, sorry if that applies to you too. Um, we can be friends. Um, I think that um, you will remember that teacher 
And if that's true of all of you people in the room, on Radio 4 they ask in these interviews quite often, who was your favourite teacher, who was the person who influenced you the most? Desert Island Discs the other day was with John Agard and he talked about his favourite teacher. And I just think, God, everybody has that person. And just, like, make that person you. Make that person you not because your lessons are amazing, but because you actually care about it and you actually care about them. And if you can do that, then I really think you've got the opportunity to make a real difference. And that's the end of what I've got to say. Thank you.